because I was broke, as I mentioned uh, before, and Yale had a policy where if you were on scholarship, you had to have you had to have a job. So I looked for the highest paying job because again, I was broke, uh, and the highest paying job was washing dishes uh, because the kitchen workers were unionized. I hate washing dishes with a passion. I'd rather have my fingernails torn out. So I went for the next highest paying job, which believe it or not, was not then computer assistant. It was helping students and professors within the libraries, with the uh, computers there. So I had to set up my Mac SE all by myself. So clearly, I was an expert. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just marched right in there and tried to convince Margaret that I was a really fast learner, that I liked helping others. Uh, and that you know I would do my best. And I'm pretty sure I was the first black kid, it was a pretty new program at the time, I'm pretty sure I was the first black kid to ever show up for, for this job. So Margaret said, what the hell? You know, I'll, 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 let's give it a shot. So the first computer assistant meeting was straight out of Big Bang Theory. I mean, <laughs> out of 30 or so kids, only four were women, and one for three years. The only, I was the only black kid for three, three years. Uh, so I don't know why I didn't just turn and run that day, and I think it's because in a room full of misfits, you know, I didn't really stand out that much, and you know, these were like the geekiest kids on campus, they were really weird, and uh, they were super curious about me, and they were actually very generous with their time. They helped, gave me the confidence that I could actually do it, they helped me to uh, learn all about computers, and after some ups and downs, I really came to enjoy it, because at the essence, the job was really about helping people, helping people navigate this new world of technology. So after I graduated, I saw the opening in the market. There were a lot of jobs for tech people. People were desperate for anyone who had tech skills. You probably remember this time. I mean, it didn't matter if you were white, black, purple, they did not care. Do you know HTML? So I started steering my career in a way such that I could unite my love of gadgets and gear, such as what I just hit the microphone with, <laughs> and my passion for connecting people and helping people and, and creating ways for, for new voices to be heard. So around the time that I was trying to learn how to use a mouse, there was a lot of talk about the digital divide. There was a lot of concern that minorities were falling behind in their use of the internet and of computers. And that's in part because broadband landlines were really slow to reach minority neighborhoods. So you got a group of people who got really good at using the internet on their mobile phones. And as the phones kept getting smarter and the internet on mobile phones kept getting faster, you had people who now have leapfrog over other populations in their use of the internet. So today, white people are the ones who lag behind all other groups in terms of their use of advanced internet, social media, and smartphones. Pew Internet actually last year showed that almost 30% of black people use Twitter. Probably didn't know that. And Hispanics are not far behind, and that's about two times the rate of whites. So, you know, for those, sometimes people are confused when they look at this chart. So this is weekly use of Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and the non-ethnics on the left, that's white people. Okay, those are the small pie charts. Right, this is right, okay. We're all, we're all good? All right. Who knows what Pinterest is? Raise your hand. A lot of people, it's a pretty smart crowd. I already knew that. So, <laughs> women, in case you were wondering, have also taken really big strides in social media. Comscore says that women are the majority of social media users, and that 50% of mobile uh, social media use is female. So this huge shift in influence and power among women has created an opportunity for tools like Pinterest, which is mobile-friendly and image-friendly, as it turns out, female-friendly. About 80% of its user base is female. And the referral traffic approaches that of Google and Facebook. <laughs> so, so what? That's all those statistics are incredibly interesting, I know, to you. And you may be thinking, that's awesome for black people and Latinos and Asian Americans and Native Americans and chicks. <laughs> <laughs> What's in it for 
for me. You know, what, what, do I, what do I have to give up? You know, say if I'm a white man, and there are just a couple here. You know, what do I have to give up to create this bright new future for everyone else? Well, and I hear you. I work with a lot of white people. <laughs> and I've worked for some white guys, and some white guys have worked for me. I've even dated white guys. I'm, I'm super sympathetic. <laughs> After all, in 2011, over 50%, the first year this happened, over 50% of the kids born in America were not white. 30 years from now, yeah, that's real. 30 years from now, whites will be the minority. And you know that's in our lifetime for most of the people in this room. So I am, as aforementioned, a lifetime card carry member of a minority. So I have some advice for you. So how, how you, can, you can navigate these seas. It's time to get down with the brown. To get jiggy. Get jiggy. Get the like we have. I'm not going to do it for you right now. Maybe later. Maybe later in the hospital. So, so right now we have a situation where resources are not efficiently finding the best investments, mainly because of false assumptions, lack of information, and straight up bigotry. In a conference a few years ago in front of a whole bunch of other fellow venture capitalists, John Doerr, who's very famous, said that when you look at the world, all the world's greatest entrepreneurs, he said, quote, they all seem to be white male nerds who dropped out of Harvard or Stanford. Mm -hmm. And they have absolutely no social life. So when I see that pattern coming in, which was true of Google, it was very easy to decide to invest. Yes. So just flipping around this, this pattern, I'm sure that John Doerr is unaware of the man for whom the term the real McCoy was, to, was coined. Do people know the, the term the real McCoy? It's a very famous, yeah, old timey phrase. But there, and it comes from, a, from an old time, not that long ago, when the railroads built this great nation. And a man named Elijah McCoy came up with an innovation that made trains run faster, with less need for maintenance, and thus more profitably. And, and railroad big bosses and CEOs and engineers wanted to know if the trains that they were running had the real McCoy rather than the stream of cheap knockoffs that appeared on the market. Now, Elijah McCoy happened to be the son of slaves. He was black. And even though we still use the real McCoy today in trains, every train, including Metro train, if you take the train to work, you are using a train that uses the real McCoy, he struggled to find capital for his groundbreaking innovation that changed the nation, that created the, the prosperity we enjoy today. 150 years later, unfortunately, not much has changed. Silicon Valley likes to think of itself as a meritocracy, a racism-free zone, and that's the right spirit to have. I've benefited from that, from that way of thinking. But I also see the results of a failure to acknowledge bias and the skewing impact it's having in innovation. Okay, there's a new digital divide. The old digital divide is dead, which is great, but now we face a new digital divide. So I'm gonna break that down for you. In 2011, out of the entire city of San Francisco, only 15 black kids took calculus. And only, and only 25, only 25 in Oakland. Yeah, so that's not very impressive. This is just one example of the type of education that our kids are just not getting in order to prepare for a career in technology. Let me tell you, there is no career, there is no job in the future that does not require technology. The garbage men who come pick up my garbage use GPS, okay, to find where I live. Right now, we have people across the country who are desperate for jobs, and yet good jobs in technology are being filled, are not being filled. Unfilled vacancies at tech recruiting firms in Silicon Valley, near, near where I live, have tripled in the past year. And this is a shortage that's causing instability and salary inflation. And our work is slowed down when we can't find qualified and trained people. More than that, the people using the services of tomorrow are not represented in the companies creating products for them today. Ultimately, that has to impact the quality of the product, right? And the amount of money that you're able to make. 
There's a lack of content for people like me. Companies create software, apps, and interfaces with the assumption that their audience are white males. Any marketing professional will tell you, you have to know your audience. Recently, I played a game, a video game, so I'm that kind of person, that had only two choices of female avatars, a young white woman and a younger white woman. <laughs> so, you know, not necessarily a product I would recommend. And finally, there's a lack of investment. Only 4 to 9 percent, according to Kauffman Foundation, of venture capital has gone to female entrepreneurs. So according to a friend of mine, Rachel Payne, who recently stepped down from leading global alliances at Google, if you're a woman who has been successful in the tech business, like me, you have bootstrapped, dodged, darted, borrowed, begged, and ultimately innovated past anyone's wildest imagination. As Dave McClure of 500 Startups said, that means if a tech company is not headed by a white male, nerd, teenage dropout, drop it's probably undervalued. It's probably actually a really good deal. <laughs> so, back to the question, what's in it for you? I think there's a lot of money to be made that's being left on the table. And you know, there's also the power of creating the future that we all want to live in. It's just time to recognize that the person who is clicking like in Facebook or just reblog something, a video on Tumblr or uploaded a photo on Instagram or just tweeted something really smart and funny is more likely to be black or brown. The people who recognize that, the companies that recognize that, are the ones that will succeed in the future and make the most money. You know, while I stand out today in a crowd of geeks, this is going to change. It has to change. It's going to make this country stronger and more prosperous, and we can't make it if we're solely reliant on importing talent from countries that have better educational systems than we do. Josh Mailman, who's right there. Josh Mailman uh, is the lead investor in Attentively, and we also have another invest investor, Drew Bernard, and I'm pretty sure he didn't invest his angel funding in Attentively because he feels sorry for me. <laughs> okay. My clients don't hire me because they feel sorry for me. My staff didn't choose to work with me because they feel sorry for me. They saw the results I've been able to create, helping amazing organizations touch millions of lives. They looked past my race and gender and saw someone with whom they could do good while doing good. together to conquer the hidden bias 
that we don't realize is there and filter out the irrationality that's distorting our marketplaces. White men are not some sickness. Okay, they are a solution. <laughs> overwhelmingly male. And yet now more women graduate with JDs and MDs and advanced degrees than men at a 60 to 40 ratio. Yeah. We can create the creators here in America, not just the consumers. It's time for a revolution of evolution. We can turn struggle into source and then into resource for our future. If you created a business, you already know how to create opportunities for others. Consider a new approach to recruiting, maybe the Eric Ries method of blacking out names on incoming resumes and business plans. Maybe start a special internship that recruits from local community colleges in your area. Those tend to be diverse because they're cheap. Hold a hackathon in the hood at a local Woo! community center. If you're a venture capitalist, consider adding some companies to your portfolio that show diversity. That's not affirmative action, and it's not a handout. Diversifying your investments is just smart investing. Anyone will tell you that. If you're a parent, let your kids play video games. Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook and now author of Lean In, recently said that all the female technologists she knows play video games as a kid, as children. And I went back to all the many hours I spent playing you know, Space Invaders and Vlogger, uh, Frogger and Centipede with my brother, who's a pilot. It's also a pretty technical career. He does trading simulations all the time, and he says they're just like video games. <laughs> Let's create more video games that do more than entertain, but actually educate and teach these little crumb snappers how to code. We love this already. There are some already, like Code Hero and Hakitsu. Finally, if you know a leader or a lawmaker, be an advocate for them for more funding for job training. Let's invest more in our educational system, because inner city schools can be places where we don't just find the best rappers or the best football players, but where probably the next technological geniuses are going to come from. Some kids out there with probably some pretty good ideas. Open your mind. Anyone can be a geek. We come in all shapes, all colors, all sizes, even blurs. Open your wallet. It takes money to make money. You all know that. You're visionary CEOs. Now is the time to invest with imagination. Information is the new oil, the new railroad. Open your heart. Margaret Krebs touched millions of lives through changing one person's life, mine. True power comes from nurturing new power, and we have the power to shape the future. Van Jones, some of you may know Van. Yeah. He recently told me that there's more power in a cell phone than actually was used. And, and just the cell phone that you have in your hand, there's more power in that cell phone than was actually used to put a man on the moon. That's how much power we're walking around with. Think about what we could accomplish if we can unleash that power within every single American. Let's unleash that force within each other together and build a new future. And that's the birth of something new. That's what's up. That's my company. We have coupons. Come see me later, $100 off. And uh, thank you so much.